Good morning, everybody. Good morning in Atlanta. Good morning around the U.S. Good morning around the world. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the uh, Mountain Lecture. As you know, Joseph Mountain was the first director or founder of CDC, uh, initially the Office of Malaria in War Areas. And um, this is the 32nd annual Mountain Lecture. I want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank our speaker for coming. Uh, it's a tremendous pleasure to introduce uh, Hans Rosling. And it's a tremendous pleasure for two reasons in particular. First, because he's such a wonderful speaker. He's one of the very few people, very few scientists who can make data come to life, who can combine tremendous creativity with tremendous rigor. And second, because by introducing him, I know that I'm speaking before him and not after. And I would hate to have to speak after him. Uh, there are two, pieces, two people who I'd hate to have to speak after, uh, Dr. Rosling and Dr. Bill Fagey. Both of them are here in the front row, so welcome. Um, Dr. Rosling is Professor of International Health at the Karolinska Institute. He's also the director of the Gapminder Foundation. Uh, as a young doctor working in rural Africa, he identified Kanzo, a rare paralytic disease, and he'll be meeting later today with our team who's been working on knotting disease in Africa to share insights. He identified that it was badly processed cassava root uh, that people were eating to stave off famine. Really going back to that fundamental connection between health and economy, between health and politics. He co-founded Doctors Without Borders of Sweden, as well as the Gapminder Gap Foundation um, and the Gapminder website, uh, which I think many of you have seen. A rare breed that combines great science with great communication. Um, Ronald Coase, the great economist, said, if you torture the data enough, it will confess. <laughs> now that's sometimes misquoted as it will confess to anything. That's not true. There is such a thing as the right analysis. And I think what you'll find is that Dr. Rosling has an uncanny ability to translate data into fascinating, understandable, and insightful presentations. Data doesn't have to be, and in fact, shouldn't be dull. Um, Dr. Rosling is a repeat TED presenter. He has more than 11 million views of his different TED presentations, and they are, I think, uh, really unparalleled in their clarity and importance. My personal favorite introduces a new mark of uh, economic development, the washing machine line. Uh, what is the level above which people can afford washing machines, and how does that change society? Well, Yogi Berra, a great American philosopher, said, um, you, can, you can observe a lot just by watching. So please join me in welcoming and watching as Dr. Rosling gives our mountain lecture. Thank you so much. Those were kind words. I started with my most important professional and training period when I was district medical officer. Yes, it's me over there. Uh, <laughs> it's the younger version. It's my wife in front of me and my colleague from Sweden there at the Nakala Hospital in northern Mozambique. And we were not aid workers. We were immigrants. I worked directly on a government contract in the government health service. And that made quite a difference. And. Uh, it was being in charge for both public health and curative health. Here, I'm treating a woman in the maternity ward. Anyone can make the diagnosis? She delivered nine days ago. She has a funny smile. It's tetanus. It's rhesus sardonicus. So, we met the situation where not even the basic vaccines had been available, but she had had one shot during the national campaign, and she did survive a tetanus with very limited resources. Now, in Sweden, I did my, I did my uh, internship in a district in northern Sweden. And <laughs> yeah, this, this is a prototype. We are developing the organic laser pointer. <laughs> 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 Q 
conception psychology says it's much, much better than the other one. The normal laser pointer, I consider a neurological disorder, you know. <laughs> <coughs> this was the district. We had five hospitals. And the number of people you can see over here, 360,000 people, 800 MDs, and 30 children were dying every year. Now, in Mozambique, I came to work in a district which had the same size geographically and almost the same number of people. But it was just one little small hospital. You just saw the photo of the entire staff in front of that hospital. That was the entire curative staff for 300,000 people. And there were 3,000 children dying every year. And we were just two MDs. Actually, one year I was alone. And the difference between being alone on 300,000 and being two is the biggest, biggest change in, in health service you can think about because you can go to rest some days. Uh, this, this situation followed me all my life. I've been trying to understand those two zeros. What does it mean to have 100 times more resources? For 100 times more resources. And what does it mean to have 100-fold bigger need? You can see it goes in the both directions. Actually, the difference between need and resources is 10,000 times. Because this population was so sick and, and they were living in such, such remote areas and, <clears throat> and difficult conditions. So, <clears throat> it has followed me to try to understand this, how it could be like this. Now, in the midst of this, I got a... I got a message when we tried to run the health service, the ordinary health service. In 1981, there was a severe drought. And from that little health post up there, we got a message. And it read more like this in short note. It was Sister Lucia, a fantastic Catholic nun who had been working there for 20 years. And she said, I've seen 30 women and children with sudden onset of paraplegia. I've never seen the disease before. Someone had worked in that health post for 20 years. This was a message. I had to go there, and this is what I met. Children with varying degree of severe spastic paralysis in their legs, with sudden onset and absolutely no other symptoms. I went through the neurology book. The only thing close to it we could find was latherism, latherism sativa. But there was no latherism in the area. It was a shocking thing. I still remember those... 20 minutes when I realized this is a new disease. And I'm sitting here alone in front of a new disease. And just three months ago, we had the South African submarine out in the bay here behind. Is this biological warfare? This was the sort of point. You know what you think about? What occupies your entire mind in that moment? It's embarrassing. 99% of your mental power goes to, I will get infected, will I die? You are just left with 1% to be useful. You get so scared. That was my problem. You get so scared yourself, and you have really to control. Hadn't it been for that nun who were calm and who took me down, I wouldn't be able to be useful. But they really helped me, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful for them. This was our, our first epidemiological survey. We, without any external fundings, we surveyed 500,000 people in four weeks with nurses on motorbikes that made very simple uh, neurological examination of the reflexes. And we could summarize that indeed we had an area with severe drought and mainly bitter cassava, and there we had 2 to 3 percent infected. You can see that, that what this shows here is 29 per thousand. We had mapped it already. We had a census after the war in Mozambique. If you have a census, you have a denominator, and that's the most important thing. And with the denominator, and we had it on the small village areas, and, we had that, and then we could get the numerator on top of that and see what a sharp geographical distribution we had of this disease. It was fully clear that there were no cases along the coast where they lived of fishing, no cases in the inland where there hadn't been a drought, and there were no cases in the cities. It didn't transmit. So 14, 15 days into the epidemic, I got my wife to come back with the children. 
because that's what we did. We evacuated the family and we put the investigation into our home. So, and we decided that the number of people who investigated the cases, we all lived together for the first. It was quite, quite dramatic. Eh? We found an association to bitter cassava, which they were the staple for. And they knew that they had lost everything else, that they were shortcutting it. It was not lack of knowledge, it was lack of food. They just didn't have anything more to eat. Cassava, as you may know, is the best converter of sunshine to calories and food that man can have come across. It's the fifth staple crop of the world. But the bitter roots yield cyanide. And that's good because it protects the crop. It has been selected purposely for it, and you can process it. But in this drought, they didn't have time. We found similar outbreaks across Africa. It took 20 years to define this disease, and 13 PhD students. And I'm most proud of Banea Mayambo, my PhD students who now teaches nutrition in Kinshasa. And, 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 and it was poverty, severe poverty. I have the permission of the family to show this photo. I've taken as a routine from the very start to always have permission of it. And people are very aware for educational purposes, you can use this. And, and it's deep, deep poverty. We published in Brain the new dis disease. We took the name of the first affected population, a report in the colonial archive, CONSO, not to link the name to a possible etiology, because we were not sure with the link to cassava. That's why we said, let's name the clinical condition so that someone can prove us wrong on the etiology. Because on the new clinical condition, we were absolutely sure that we were right. It was a new disease. Now, at this point, I had to make a choice in my career. Would I go to try to find out the brain, what was the damage of this? I met with Carlton Gajdusek. I got advice on how we would do to go the neurological way. I was more motivated to go on and look into the poverty. The rest of my career had been to try to understand the deep poverty in remote rural areas of Africa and why the world looked as it is. And especially, I got annoyed at that time about the idea of a world with developing countries and developed countries. If we look at the map here, I regard, I regard this software here as a map. Eh? Eh? I'll give you a full screen there. <clears throat> In this map, instead of north and south, I have healthy 80 years life expectancy in the north and 30 years in the south. And then I have low income, 300, 3,000, and 30,000 dollars. That means that you can see that there are other countries, 1981, Mozambique was indeed one of the poorest countries and one of the countries with the lowest health situation. This was before HIV and AIDS. We are, here to, we are here years before the HIV outbreak. But the colonial past and the past war of independence had put Mozambique there. And Sweden was up here. You can imagine the difference as a young physician to go from there to there. But I found that most of the world was in between. And when I studied it carefully, I couldn't see any cutoff. Can you see a cutoff between the developing world and the developed world? No, it was in the mindset. It's in the mindset. There are countries all the way. This was China at this time. The green ones here, because the size of this bubble is the size of the population. That is Russia. This is United States. The yellowish ones here is America, brown Europe, red East Asia, light blue South Asia, dark blue is Africa, and green is the Middle East. There are countries all the way. And I couldn't understand how people would think about the developing world. You have worked in the developing worlds. I got the concept. You can't describe the American history into two chapters and put Mayflower and Eisenhower in the same chapter. No, it doesn't make sense. Think about the progress of this country from Mayflower to Washington to Lincoln to Eisenhower to Obama. Those are different stages in development, in health and economy, in civil rights, everything. And the world is 
In the same way, we need more categories. The idea of understanding the world in two categories doesn't have intellectual content. I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about advocacy. Yes, purely intellectual, it doesn't make sense. And this is why I came to study after a while the macro level. And I realized that if we go back into history, they were all poor and sick. <laughs> Even if United Kingdom was a little richer than the United States and thought it was a very bad idea of United States to go for independence. Of course you could see that you would be richer. Here they said, look, you are still better off with us. Even Netherlands is here in between. <laughs> and then what happened is this, that United Kingdom forged on and United States tried to prove that independence was a good idea, you know, and here they came up and there the proof of independence came. <laughs> it was a good idea, wasn't it? Yeah? And the rest of the world looked at the United States and said, yeah, it's a good idea to be independent. Why don't we get independent, just like the United States of America? And in 1914, you know, 1918, after the First World War, United States stood up as the big example for the colonized countries in the world to, to, to become independent. Uh, but that was to take another recession and another world war and then they got independent and they raced up here they came they got healthy first and then they got rich look at the comparison if we go back here and we compare china and us united states and china what we learned is that while United States was developing technology, improving its economy, you know, and gradually research was giving us more and more, we can put trails on these bubbles there. Yeah? But it really was money first and then came health. Then came health. China was down in the corner. When China emerged, they went straight up in health until Mao Zedong made the stupid great leap. They fell down in famines and then they came up here and there Mao Zedong died and Deng Xiaoping said, let's go for the money. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, it stands out. They got healthy first and then they got wealthy. Wednesday morning I lectured to a similar group at Goldman Sachs on Manhattan. They are desperate. They invite Swedish public health professors. <laughs> and I told them, why do you do this? You do this because today in the world, health improvement, demographic change precedes economic growth. It's another pattern. But everyone wants to go from being poor and sick to being rich and wealthy. But there are different tracks you can follow. And the historical track was you had to be wealthy first and then Procter & Gamble 1834 started to make industrially produced soap and shipped it off the Ohio River. And that's major public health intervention. Always remember the soap. Today we talk about hand washing. It was one of the major reasons for improved health in the Midwest was the soap and the candles, which came handy at relatively low cost because of efficient production. Now, <clears throat> this is the world today. This is what Tom Friedman called the flat world. They are healthy from here. Can you see? They are healthy all the way. There is actually a bigger difference in this dimension. In one-tenth of the income, they almost, this is Vietnam, they almost have the same health as it is in the, in the still terrible and unacceptable variation in health from 50 to 80 years. We have a world which indeed has changed. Someone who saw this yesterday cited Dorothy when she came to that Emerald City and said, this is not Kansas anymore, you know. Look here, this was the world we were used to. Eh? And now they've come up very fast like this. Now, let me show you what I'm, I've come to conclude. Is that we know too little about the world. This is our website. Uh, we have this. This is free of charge. We run Gapminder Foundation. It's a non-profit. It's a strategically non-profit, not ideologically. We're like a museum, 
that stays at arm length from corporate and government. And we don't run advocacy for anything. It's just a roadmap for the world, which you can use. Now look here. We have found that there are some points in global development that are not well known. When I was born, 1948, there was less than 1 billion children in the world, 0 to 50. And then, during my lifetime, the number of children indeed increased. At the turn of the century, there were 2 billion. And United Nations Population Division, which is just civil servants of the world, as you are, eh, they made an estimate. Did they estimate that it was going to continue to grow to 4 billion? that it would slow down and be 3 billion? Or did they say, uh-uh, we are not going to get any more children in the world. They have stopped growing. How many here think there will be 4 billion? Hands up. How many think 3 billion? How many know that it will be 2 billion? <laughs> it's interesting, huh? Uh, these have missed. It's one of the major news. It's, of course, an estimate. But with their uncertainty level, it will be more or less at this level. And why is it so? Well, let me show you another graph here, which will explain this. And this is very important, because the most common question or protest that Bill and Melinda Gates get for their, their really, really good donation, both in size and in quality for health of the poorest, is if you save the poor children, you destroy the planet. This is the single most common comment that the economists get by mail when they write about global health. That idea that saving poor children will cause a population explosion. Now, this is 1962, 50 years ago. Here I have now eight children, seven, six, five, four, three, two. Small families here, big families there. Here we have child mortality, 100, 200, 300 per thousand. That means one third of the children die. So in 1962, very clearly that there were two countries, isn't it? Two types of countries. I have a cluster here, and I have a cluster over there. Almost no country was in between. Just one little yellow one there. Can you see it? Which one is this intermediate? It's Cuba. It was a rhetoric success of enormous proportion when Castro managed to become leader of this group to which he didn't belong. It's in fact Cuba was in between. The child mortality in Havana in 1920 was the same as in Berlin and Paris. Cuba, Cuba was quite advanced. Now there were other political injustices and other political reasons that brought about the revolution. Not that Cuba was one of the poorest countries in the world and was, was like this group up here. So really, with that exception and some other small exception like Singapore, aha, uh -huh. so if you should compare Cuba's progress, you should compare it with Singapore. They were the closest neighbor. That was baseline there. Now, what happened here? They had few families and they had a few children, they had many children. And it looked almost the same, 1968, and then this is too much, Paul Ehrlich said. This would be a population bomb, and he scared the world. What has happened since Paul Ehrlich? Eh? Here we go. Family planning started in China. Mao Zedong was quite successful with that. They got smaller family. India tried to follow. Look here, Brazil and Mexico doesn't care about the Vatican. They go for family planning. <laughs> here comes, here comes the, the Arab world. Look at Iran. The Islamic Republic of Iran is merging forwards here. Here is Pakistan. Bangladesh is overtaking India. And almost all countries is moving down to there. A completely new world. It's more bigger change than when I showed the economy. And what, is, what am I measuring here? What is it I'm measuring here eh? when I show this enormous change? Child mortality, you know. This I consider to be the bedroom. It's the only decent and acceptable way in which you can peep into the bedroom of other people. It's like looking at fertility rate. And you have a wonderful, wonderful expression in, 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 in America about this. You call this pillow talk. It's the young couple whispering into each other's ears, we'll make a baby tonight. <laughs> we'll have two. <laughs> we'll work hard our entire life to make their life better than ours was. Eh? 
That combination of love, children, and hard work, that builds the world, that builds countries. That's what I told Goldman Sachs. It ain't you that makes the, it ain't you that makes the emerging economy. It's the young couples working hard for their children and their grandchildren. That's what makes the world. Then you can facilitate it if you behave. Huh? Then government can facilitate government institution that yours is extremely important for this. But look what we have. The average number of children per woman in the world is 2.4 today. It isn't Kansas anymore. It has changed, you know. Whereas you still find Congo and Afghanistan over there. But 80% of, of, of the world population live where two-child families are the most common size of families. And that has already happened. That has already happened. And, and if, I, if I change the child mortality here over to, to life expectancy, it becomes sort of quite clear that most countries are up here and they say, oh, it's because the communist in China has a one-child policy. Mm. Communists normally are not so successful. <laughs> They've only made it to 1.6, and with some methods really cruel and unacceptable. So how come, if it was the communists who made it, how come that, that Japan has less children per woman? How come that the only part of mainline China that never had a one-child policy have one child per woman? Hong Kong. I was at an investment conference recently in Hong Kong and ended up at the dinner with the most successful banker recently in Hong Kong. She was only 35 years old. And I asked her at the dessert, you work so hard. Don't you think about family? And she said, yes, every day I think about children. It's the idea of a husband I can't stand. <laughs> so this, this is what we see happening. We attribute too much to religious leaders and political leaders. If they are good, they can be helpful. If they are bad, they can be a problem. But people make the decisions in their bedrooms today across religion. There is no more children per woman in Muslim countries than in Christian countries. Today it's the same. Qatar has one child per woman. Bangladesh has, um, Indonesia has the same number of children per woman as this country has. There's no religious difference. Then there are Muslim countries like Somalia with very many children, and there are Christian countries like Congo. But that's socioeconomy behind that. So, so really we have had an enormous change here. And, and uh, what we can see is if we look at this map, of course you would see here that, I'm back now with child mortality over there and family size. You see that Africa tend to be here, though there's a big diversity within Africa, African countries. They seem to have higher child mortality and higher fertility rate. And indeed those are, are good figures. That's right. But there's very big difference in Africa. Time has come never more to think about sub-Saharan Africa as one unit. Think about it as Asia was 1970. You saw Thailand and Malaysia forging ahead. You saw Cambodia and Afghanistan heading for tragedies. The same things we are seeing in Africa. Difference between countries and difference within countries. I split Tanzania. Urban Tanzania is there. Rural Tanzania is like Afghanistan. And there's lack of access to contraception. There are 30% of women who want to have contraception. You don't have to run population program and intervene with people's own decision. Just let them decide for their own. They see when time has come to have fewer children. When children don't have to go and carry water, but they should go to school instead. Then they will get less children and then make their own decisions. Never intervene with people's decision. Just make it possible for them to live the life they want. Huh? Ethiopia have less children per woman in Addis Ababa than the United States of America. And in the Somali region, uh, where they have civil war, it's worse than Afghanistan. Huh? So this is the world. Catholics in Mexico, Muslims in Bangladesh, Hindus in India, Buddhists in Thailand for the front, uh, future with two children, and they invest in them. This is the, 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 the driver of the emerging economy. This is the driving of the world, precisely as this has been in the US. 
people are amazingly similar across the world. They're amazingly similar. The most important is family life. The most important is the future of your children. That's quite similar across the world. And, and uh, it's so basic. Before the Industrial Revolution, the parents, a typical couple, got six children. And <clears throat> why didn't the population grow? Uh, because, because, sadly, three and four children died before growing up to become parents themselves. This was the old balance. I hear people say that in the rainforest, people live in ecological balance with nature. This is wrong. They die in ecological balance with nature. <laughs> but their human rights should be defended. That's another issue. But it's a very tragic life condition. That's why there are so few people in the rainforest. There is no secret family planning contraceptive device in the leave anywhere. They die. That's why my population is low. What happened then? When the Swedes filled up Minnesota, was that <laughs> it was that four children survived, there were less dying, and then they went. It was that life got better in Sweden. That's what sent the Swedes across the Atlantic. Huh? And, and, and then many think that it will continue like this, but it will not. We have almost reached the new balance, which most of us would like to live in. We would see the birth of about two children, and we don't want to see a child die before ourselves. And, and the UN population division say we will be just 10 billion. And many have difficulties accepting this because it continues to grow. So they say, you must be wrong if you say there are just little more than two children per woman, but it continues to grow, billion and billion. It has to stop now, otherwise the polar bear will die. Let's see how good they are at United Nations Population Division. In 1958, they did the first 42-year projection of world population. And they said, by the year 2000, we will be between 6 and 7 billion. And everyone laughed at them. If you go and read the newspapers from that time, they, were, they made jokes. 1968, they came back and said, oh, perhaps we were wrong, there will be a little more. But somewhere still below 7. 7 will be after. And then 1978, they said, no, now it's false in China. We will be worth there. Now we know. I can't check up to now because we only know for sure how many we were the year 1000. This was the result. Respect. <laughs> I think we, we epidemiologists, infectious disease, you didn't tell about AIDS in advance. You didn't tell about SARS in advance. Suddenly you appear in the news. Oh, something new has come up. We didn't know about that, but now it's here. It's terrible, you know. And those at Goldman Sachs, they are even worse, you know. They don't even, they don't even know what will happen with the economy, you know, the next day, you know. So, <laughs> but demographers are good. Demographers are very good. They know people are very similar in the world. It's just when death rates go down, birth rates will follow, and it's just how, how these uh, things will be. They know that we will be about 10 billion. But how come we will increase so many when we almost have stopped growing? I'll show you. This is the world today. We have 2 billion children below 15, almost 2 billion between 15 and 30, 1 billion, 30 to 45, 1 billion here, and this is me, you can recognize me up there. <laughs> eh? 60 plus, 60 plus. Why are these persons missing? Why are these billion missing? Have they died? No, they were never born. Because when I was born, there were much less women giving birth, and even if they gave birth to more children, there were fewer children born. So this means that this is the sort of the global population pyramid. And now I will show you why we will be 3 billion more without getting more children and without living longer. Question number one, what happens to people like me? This is CDC, you must know. <laughs> what happens to old people? They die, yes. Don't be megalomanic and think you can, you can win over death. You know. This is you, the young fellows, you know. You are between 15 to 30. This is the young people here, you know. But people like me will go down like there and they will go bye-bye there. And the rest will grow older and they will get their children. Now, where are the young fellows? Oh, they are up there. 
They became 15 years older. The old? Uh, they have high ambitions here, your staff, you know. <laughs> they really want to go at it, you know, eternal life. They get older, they get their children, there you are, and they go away, and then they get older, and they get their children. And the young fellows will be, I won't run it so that the young people don't know, want to know what happens to them. <laughs> I'll spare them for today, I'll spare them for today. One, two, three billion more without having more children, without living longer. Did you see? The big fill up. It's called population momentum. No one understood it. There's inevitable that we will be at least two billion more. If we start getting fewer children, we may stop at nine, nine and a half. But, but it's inevitable that we will be two more. This is a big, big historical change. Where do we live? One billion in America, one billion in Europe, one billion in Africa, and one, two, three, four in Asia. As simple as that. Two billion more by 2050, one billion more in Africa, one billion more in Asia. And by the end of the century, as projection says, now one billion more in Africa. Which was the first head of marketing in Africa that phoned me for a long conversation from the corporate sector? Coca-Cola. They have the idea where there is a village, there should be a Coke. And I, to a certain extent, coming from Sweden, like Coke, because when it replaces heavy beer and alcohol, it does well for public health. That's why Gorbachev liked Coca-Cola. He wanted to replace vodka. In the vodka part of the world, you know, Coca-Cola is good for health. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and um, if I divide America into North and South, and Europe into East and West. You get what we used to call, and someone still call it the Western world, though they have no definition. Sort of difficult how big part of Greece I should include here, but I, <laughs> I took a part of it here. It's really a continuum. And the most important to understand is in the future, those who used to dominate the world economy will only be 10% of the world population. 80% will live in Asia and Africa. And the take-home message for Goldman Sachs was buy real estate around the Indian Ocean. <laughs> That's where the world, main world trade will be in the future. It will be an enormous change. And this is the strong demographic change with, which will not be much affected about other things. Now, uh, we call this developing world. Change the name immediately. It's the world. It's the world. That, that division doesn't, doesn't make much, much, much sense to me. Eh? And, and um, uh, we, shall, we have to get to know this better. I got the opportunity in Sweden to test the knowledge of the Swedish population. Our government makes a survey every year about their will to give foreign aid. And about the majority of the people want to continue with foreign aid. They have some, many ideas about how to give it. But that it should be given is very strong. But I put knowledge question. These are two of them. I asked how many of the 20 years old can read in Tanzania? They got four alternatives. Number of babies per woman in Bangladesh, four alternatives. Well-known countries for Sweden. These were the Swedish answers. This is the correct. Of four possible, they got 5%. I needed a control group, I went to the zoo, I asked the chimps, they got 25%. <laughs> Can you imagine how embarrassing? I have to spend the rest of my life to lift the Swedish population from this level up to the chimp level. <laughs> because the problem is not ignorance. If it was ignorance, they would get 25% right. The problem is preconceived ideas that the world still is as it was 25 years ago. There's a 25-year time lag about understanding the world. Some there, these trends have fallen in between the textbooks and the news media. And we don't, we don't manage, manage to, to, to get them through. Now, uh, you can see what it means, this population growth. Huh? This, is, this is the world. State in more serious graphics. It was growing like this. The 0 to 14 was growing. There they stopped growing. You see the number of children stopped growing. Then the other age groups are growing. Then they are growing. This is the big fill up. There's no way you can stop this. This is the younger just growing up. 
and we will be about 10 billion by the end of this century. There's another one which I would like to show you, and that is, that is Tanzania. This is Tanzania today, 46 million people. And they have quite a high fertility rate. You saw the rural areas almost like, like Afghanistan. The number of children is growing. Eh? And here they will bypass Germany in size. 36. Eh? Then they will come up and Tanzania will match the United States of America. This is why it's so wise and so good that this knowledgeable Catholic woman from the United States is telling the right thing. Melinda Gates said, we have forgotten family planning in the poorest one to two billion. We have to provide it in the same way as we have done. Not intervening with people in any way, what they will. Not coming with value judgment. Just make it available. I have met so many women across rural Africa, very poor women, who have to walk for miles and miles to get that shot or that pill which they badly need because they want to take care of the children they have and get them through school and make a decent future for them. Eh? Tanzania need that assistance. Once upon a time, it was the United States of America who started world fertility study and who started to provide the modern contraceptives to the world. Continue to do so. It will be good for you, it will be good for the poor people, it will be good for the world. And, and uh, this uh, reality we can show you in a little more complex way, perhaps. Let me try. Can you see what I'm doing? I'm using two fingers. <laughs> Normally, professors just use one finger. Next, next, next. I, I do Alt-Tab, and I have several open windows here in my lecture. And I can go and choose the ones I want to continue with where I were in my lecture. There I was. So now I'm in my PowerPoint again. Now each doll here is 100 million. These are the ones below 50. There are 20. Most are Asians. This is Africa. This is America. And look at Europe, already shrinking. A boring place. <laughs> uh, great museums. <laughs> Come visit. Uh, America isn't that excited either. The only thing you will add is 100 million seniors in Latin America, and that's it. Africa has 400 million below 15 years today after child mortality has taken out some the first years. That means that if Africa turns Thailand tonight with 75 years lifespan and two children per woman, Africa will still double its population. There is no way Africa can stop growing below 2 billion. That's why Coca-Cola phoned me. This will be a very important place in the world. And they have resources. And now they have human skill. And now Africa has 5% economic growth. Sub-Saharan Africa. Take out su South Africa. Still 5% economic growth. And it's not oil and mineral. It is diversified economic growth. 5%. Europe 0.3. I never thought I would live to the day when Africa was growing 15-fold faster than Europe. It's a true catch-up taking place. And when you visit, you can see that it's real figures. Things are changing, but it's changing for the better 20 to 40 percent of the population, not all the way out. It's the rural, remote rural areas which remains the challenge. So what will happen, you know by now, they all die, the rest grow older, and they get their children. They all die, the rest grow older, and they get their children. They all die, the rest grow older, and they get their children. And they all die, and they grow older, and they get their children. The reason the number of children is not growing in the world is that they are decreasing in Africa. Remember the banker in Hong Kong? Gender equity is lacking in Asia. Women prefer not to marry or have very few children. In Africa, poverty is still there. Now, how much of this in is inevitable? This is the inevitable fill-up. This is up for discussion and action. Okay? Because as poverty goes away fast in Africa, this can be like this. And it's probably be better for everyone, for families, communities, and countries in Tanzania. I, I tell African leaders, you have the choice. Either you become many and rich, or you become very many and still poor. 
This is really the, the choice to, to fill up. But it's not, it's not the family planning is not the solution. It's just an intermediate step that follows the success in, in, in literacy and health. Uh, it's just one component of it. It's not as, as it was talked in the past, we have to have family planning to stop the poor. It's not at all. It's just one component, and you can consider it as a human right. Longer lifespan is not that important. I know that, that CDC is moving into chronic diseases now, you know. And you maybe have some success, so I've added one doll for you up there. <laughs> uh, for the cardiovascular group, this is what you're fighting for, and I hope I will be that one. There may be one in Africa. That's a minor thing, you know. We know that lifespan is still about inequalities, alcohol, and tobacco. That's what it's about. So this is what we know. We know fairly well what will happen. In Europe, it happened first, now shrinking. America just stopping its growth, and that's from Canada to Argentina. Asia stopping within 30 to 40 years. An interesting thing, growing among the old while shrinking in the young. Many people say, oh, China is growing old because they live longer. No. The population get a higher proportion of old people because they get few children. Germany and Japan get a high proportion of old people because they don't get birth to children. Because women doesn't have a good equity. Provide a good equity for kids, you get like in Sweden almost two children per woman again. We have been down there, we have come up there. The United States of America is a special issue in demography. It doesn't compare with anyone. Eh? So and it's a diversity that needs its own analysis. But generally, it, it's like this, that it's, it's the, purport, the balance, and demographers talk about balance of population, rather. Now, <clears throat> how do we look at the world? Look at this graph. Here I have child mortality on logarithmic scale, 10, 100, and more. Here I have the economy on logarithmic scale. And you can see it's almost a line, almost a linear relation between money and child mortality. That's why I love money. Because I know how to spend it. I can study more your, your results. You know, we can, in public health, we know how to spend money, and we should love it. Because we know without economic growth, we will not be able to improve health until a certain limit. And that's this lower line here. Uh, and if you, if you look at, at this, you, you have a problem here knowing where's the cutoff for developing countries. UNICEF used to have this cutoff until last year. They said, these are the developing countries. Uh, uh, Qatar is not the developing countries because they are Arabs. And also South Korea is not developing. And Singapore is the developing countries. And then they go up here. And Russia is developed. And they go down here. Malaysia is developing countries. Albania is developed. It's quite an advanced algorithm, isn't it? <laughs> I told Tony Lake, you are some sort of a mathematician, I said. Huh? <laughs> and then, then, then I got a phone call from Tony Lake and said, you're right, we'll stop it. As of this year, UNICEF in their statistic does not use the concept any longer. They take the world, they take regions, they take countries, they drill down to inequalities within countries. I think it's a very, very good move. Huh? You look here, Bangladesh, this is the, what I call the max equality and the minimum equality line. This is Bangladesh. Here I let the size of the bubble be the number of child deaths. So There's very few child deaths below $4,000. Bangladesh, upper quintile is there, lower quintile is there. You also follow this. Surprisingly equity, equitable country, also very densely populated. We used to consider dense population bad. It's good for health because you get the services around, you get the knowledge around like this. And, and, and these cuts off are interesting. This is the cut off for Gavi, for getting vaccines. You get free vaccine by aid here, here you pay. This is the duck cut off for aid. I'm strongly critical to that. We should consider Brazil and Russia and Turkey as emerging donors and move this line to here. It doesn't make sense to consider Brazil a recipient of development aid when Brazil, since five years back, lend this country $30 billion a year to cover the budget deficit. It's exactly the same amount of money as US aid budget. So it's Dilma Rousseff who put the cash on the table for the US aid budget. And, and, and we have a rule in Sweden, those who lend money to US shouldn't get aid from us. 
It sort of makes sense. Instead, we have now written an agreement with Brazil to join hand with Brazil to improve the quality of our aid to Africa, because they are quite good to work with in many, in many ways. And this is good, because there will be countries graduating from aid. I think people will understand that quite well, that it has been successful. They don't need aid any longer. We focus on the poorest, because that's really what we need to do. Now, <clears throat> if, we, if we would... Uh, would look at the income distribution of the world. It's looking more or less like, like this. One dollar, the poverty line, ten dollar, and here, hundred dollar, purchasing power. This was 2000, about 19% in poverty. This is Africa. Uh, this is OECD countries, what used to be called the West. This is Latin America, like a green anaconda. And this is East Europe, former Soviet. This is East Asia, and this is South Asia. And if we go back to when I was a student, eh, and I trained in public health in Bangalore in 1972, it was an ex enormously good experience, then you can see how things have changed. The population have grown, and indeed people have come out of poverty. And we have so many different levels people live on today. We go up to almost here today, 2011, with a projection. This is where we are. We have to have different understanding of those in extreme poverty. Those are special actions needed. We need to have another health policy here at low-income countries, lower-middle-income countries, upper-middle-income countries, and high-income countries. Let me give you an example of this. Let me give you an example. And that is... <coughs> Middle-income country, Mrs. Bala, chronic myeloid leukemia at the age of 55. Two children, four grandchildren. She wants to live. And she knows if she gets Gleevec, she will live. Gleevec is a fantastic drug from Novi Artis. It's a true innovation, not like those Me Too. It really keeps people with a severe disease alive for a long time. Problem is, she and her children cannot cover the research cost. What should her daughter tell her? Dear mother, there is a treatment, but that was done by great research, and they have to recover the cost of that research. So we cannot treat you now. We will have your funeral, and within 17 years there will be a generic. Then we can open the grave and we can treat you. Doesn't make sense. Big Pharma is a failure of business model. I'm not against profit. I'm not against innovation. I'm not against po uh, patent. I'm just in favor of clever business models. Clever business model. And this can be done better. Here we have Dr. Vazela in Novi Artis, that I highly respect, and uh, Mr. Yusuf of Sipla, generic company in India, that I highly respect. This is my problem. I respect them both from their perspective. And, and Vazela said, you're a pirate if you copy this drug without agreement. Eh? You're a monopolist with the demands you have. We have to settle this. We have to have clever, clever business models for this. Because people in middle-income countries need to have treatment for these diseases. Eh? And in the high-income countries, cochlear implant can make people hear. Eh? And that's very costly. Could that be provided? Should that be provided? That can't be done in all over the world. We need good sign language throughout the world so that the deaf community can have a rich life. Eh? But we also have another possibility now. Now, there are so many different cost levels. And when we went back to Mozambique, my wife and I, after, after 30 years, I met Dr. Fernau, who is my, <coughs> my replacement. Now, 30 years later, more clever, more knowledgeable, better apt for the task there, more senior to me than I worked there. I became speechless listening to him. That's very rare that I become speechless. <laughs> My wife said, you didn't say anything for 40 minutes, she said. It was nice sitting next to you, she said. <laughs> he knew everything. You know? He was very aware of what he could treat, what he couldn't treat. You know? And, 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 and uh, my wife, who was a midwife when we was there, she was amazed by the new maternity ward. Look what they've done 2011. Eh? They have doubled the population. They have added one more hospital. They have um, 16 medical doctors instead of two. 
that, that's, that's a growth of 7% a year. That's quite, quite fast growth. Huh? And they still have 3,000 children, but, death, but that's been twice the population. But the problem was when we went here to the remote part of the district, and we cut the line here, then we found two young colleagues as unexperienced as I was when I was there 30 years ago, and there's still two MDs per 300,000 people there. The country, the world has to progress so fast so that the poor people doesn't grow faster than the progress. And at least they need to have access to contraceptives when they want it themselves. And this is the main challenge, I think, for health, is to reach up here. Here we still saw 13-year-old girls pregnant dying in a transverse lie with a uterine rupture because they came too late down here to be able to go here for the cesareans. We couldn't do cesareans now, they do 300 years, and they are skilled Mozambicans. And the biggest change my wife saw at the maternity war was not the material walls and nice shining. It was the quality of the staff. The young Mozambicans were impressed. They were really good now. They can do it, but it has to be faster. We must eliminate extreme poverty, and health is one important component. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Yes, and even protests. <laughs> what I do is that I make severe simplification. I call it evidence-based vulgar simplification. Did you hear about that guy who went up with a balloon 30 kilometers up? That's me. I'm way above my competence level. <laughs> the only thing I can do being so high is making that position an advantage. Huh? trying to look from above. I may have may committed some severe errors, you know, in this, and in such a knowledgeable audience as here, I, I very much uh, welcome protest and correction. No protest here. Thank you very much. I had a question based on your comments about uh, urban density. Um, you made a, a comment that perhaps some of the density was about knowledge transmission in closer settings. And I was wondering if you've looked at technology, particularly um, cell phones and the ability to connect populations not just by urban density, and whether that has uh, caused any of that type of effect that you were suggesting. I'm next week meeting the CEO at Ericsson, and I've asked him to get the map of cell phone coverage. I think we need to put the census map, and on top of that, the cell phone coverage map. We may get so carried away by the cell phone coverage so we don't think about those who live without cell phone coverage. Then you can do a lot. Cell phones are being used now in disasters, but that's the small problem compared to poverty. You can use the pattern of cell phone use and see where you have more text than voice. That's where you have poverty. When I was at Google, we did a survey in Uganda and one one comment uh, sticks to me, and that the person said, if I have a lot to say, I text. If it's just a little, I voice. Still today, the mobile cell phone companies let the text subsidize the voice. Text messages are so cheap, they don't occupy any bandwidth at all. They can almost be free. Instead of the $100 computer, let's make the $1 text phone with solar energy. Text can be, can be very, very cheap, and, and the coverage will probably function with market mechanism. But, but the problem is the coverage. And we, I haven't seen the map. I haven't seen the map with coverage. I just know, uh, you know the Millennium Villages by Jeff Sachs. I like a lot of things Jeff Sachs have done. I don't like the Millennium Villages. It, it's trying to do missionary stations in a, in a new version. You need to have the entire district developed, and you have to go together with all the parts of the district. But his evaluation showed two things. First, they have really picked villages in remote areas, and cell phone coverage was very low. It's the most important in that Lancet publication. The number, it was like 20% only who had cell phone coverage. 
So we must remember, I probably think that we have most of the child death, the maternal deaths, you know, the possible new emerging diseases, you know, severe forms are outside cell phone coverage. Uh, and, and, and the poor people, when the population grows in the poor remote villages on fragile land, the young couple have two choices, go to the urban area or go further out in the outskirts and start opening a new village. Like, just like the big frontier in the west here. Eh? Like, like my folks, that, that when Minnesota filled up, they went on to the Oregon Trail. Eh? People are doing this all the time out to remote areas and then they move outside cell phone coverage and only when they have raised enough money someone will put the mask there. I may be wrong on this, I just haven't seen that analysis. We get too carried away with the cell phone. We may miss the deep poverty there. Seems everything else is crisp. It's because you're a manager, that's why they oppose you all the time. <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much for coming and even more for the work that you've done in helping us to come to, I think, a more sophisticated and uh, uh, detailed awareness of how the world works and how health works. We need to look at not just the big trends, but both the big trends and the micro trends, and your exploding of countries within countries and seeing the, the differences there, I think, are crucial as we see an increasing number of, uh, or increasing amount of the preventable illness of the world is going to be in middle income countries, not in low income countries, and from a changing pattern of diseases only by looking at that data and making. Uh, our programs match that data, are we going to be effective? So thank you very much for what you've done. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much.